Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we started the second video on chapter 3. And this is going to cover 3.1 and 3.2. Chapter 3, video 2. Uh, we're going to cover these three topics. Describe the effects of osmosis in plant and animal tissues. And explain the importance of water potential gradient and osmosis in the uptake and loss of water. Then investigate. Whenever it's an investigate, you know we have to do the practical procedures. Investigate and explain the effects on plant tissues of immersing them in solutions of different concentrations using the term turgid, turgor pressure, plasmolysis and flaccid. Investigate osmosis using materials such as dialysis tubing. Now these are two of course we will handle at the end of the video. But 7 and of course I will handle uh, 3.2, 1 and 2 first and then I will investigate, then I will talk about the investigations. In active transport we have to understand active transport as the movement of molecules or ions. You see diffusion was, uh, you have to talk about diffusion and osmosis. Osmosis is only the movement of net movement of water molecules. This is important that you remember this. Osmosis is the net movement of molecules. And in diffusion, understand diffusion is the net movement of molecules or ions. So in one we have molecules and ions, here also we have molecules and ions. And here we only have movement of water molecules. Now this is a change in the new syllabus, this wasn't in the old syllabus. So understand active transport is a movement of molecules and ions into or out of a cell, through the cell membrane from a region of their low concentration to a region of their higher concentration. So lower, higher, we are going to use a comparative statement against a concentration gradient using energy released during respiration. The word is released, not produced. Released, RE released, RE respiration. Explain the importance of active ion transport in ion uptake by root hair cells. So if you know the syllabus, then you know what you need to study and what you need to be clear about. Now first a little basic. Uh, now you can see this a plant cell in a dilute solution becomes turgid. Dilute solution means what? This is a 1% solution and inside this, this is a 2% solution. So water will enter and the uh, this will be pressing on the outside and the cell membrane will be pressing on the cell wall and we cell that the cell becomes fully turgid. Now if it's in the same concentration like inside it is 2% and outside also it is 2%. Then of course the cell is in equilibrium and there is no net movement of water molecules. Now when you place this in a concentrated solution, so if it is 2% inside and it is 3% outside, then water is going to move out from a area of higher water potential. So there will be a higher water potential here to an area of lower water potential. So water is going to move out and the cell becomes flaccid. And plasmolyzed cell cytoplasm is pulled away from the wall. So this is the cytoplasm which has now along with the cell membrane has been pulled away from the. Now previously the cell membrane was all closely adherent to the cell wall. Now it has pulled away from the wall. And now the cell is plasmolyzed cell. So this is the differences that you need to understand. This is turgid. This is in the same solution. This now cell in a concentration becomes flaccid. And this of course is, will be a, even worse than that. So water will have moved out by osmosis. And then of course what will happen is that you can see we don't say the cell shrinks because the cell wall maintains the structure of it slightly. Slightly but it's still this is not an animal cell. It's a plant cell. Now let's look at certain new wordings isotonic. Isotonic means it's the same concentration inside, it's the same uh, concentration. If it is 2% inside, it is also 2% iso, so it's an isotonic solution. Hypotonic means that inside is 2%, outside is 1%. So water will move in. So the cell is turgid. But in a hypotonic solution means this is 2% and outside is 3%. So hypertonic. So water will move in from the 2% to the 3% solution from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. So the cell will become plasmolyzed. Now turgid is a distended or swollen especially due to high fluid content. 
Turgor pressure or turgidity pushes the cell membrane against the cell wall caused by the osmotic flow into the vacuole. Healthy plant cells are turgid and plants rely on turgidity to maintain rigidity. So turgidity, rigidity, they are two different words. You must be very clear about them. Now, if you look at this, this is a turgid cell. A turgid cell is one in which the plasma membrane presses tightly against the cell wall. And this is in a hypotonic solution, means that the 1% outside and 2% inside. So water has moved in and the cell membrane now is pushing it outside. So water has moved in and it's in a hypotonic. Hypotonic means hypo means less. So inside the cytoplasm or the tonoplast, the cell sap is 2% and outside it is 1%. So water has moved in from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. Now in this situation, this is in a hypertonic solution. Hypertonic means inside it is 2%. Outside it's hyper. Hyper means more. This person is very hyper, means he's very excited, is very energetic. So a plasmalized cell is in much so much cell water has been lost by osmosis that the cell membrane or the plasma membrane contorts away from the cell wall, means it breaks away from the cell wall, it moves away from the cell wall. You can see the cell membrane is now inside, it has moved away from the cell wall. The cell wall is this one here. Now the third one is flaccid in an isotonic solution. A flaccid cell is one in which the cell membrane does not press tightly against the cell wall. It is there, but it is not tightly against the cell wall. And this is in an isotonic solution. Isotonic means inside it is 2% and outside it is 2%. So it is a no net movement of water molecules is taking place. No net movement of water molecules is taking place. Now you can see the effects of uh, uh, how it affects a plant and how uh, it will cause it to wilt. So you can see in this uh, plant texture a balance between the cell wall and the cell vacuole. The water storing vacuole pushes outwards on the cell wall. You can see these arrows pushing outside on the cell wall. The water storing vacuole pushes on the cell wall keeping it firm and rigid. At the same time the cell wall has enough mechanical strength to constrain the vacuole. Now in this case, a full vacuole provides a rigid structure to the plant, but an empty vacuole causes the cell walls to shrink and to pull away from the neighboring cell. This results in the droopy appearance of wilted plants. Droopy appearance of wilted plants. Now you can see here a lodia in fresh and salt water. Now cell membrane is not visible because water is pushing it against the cell wall. So you can see the chloroplast, you can see the cytoplasm, you can see the cell wall. The cell membrane is number one too thin. It's only five nanometers. So it is very closely sticking to the cell wall. But in this situation, when the water has moved out, then you can see the cell membrane sort of enclosing it. You can see it because it's enclosing this structure. Salt solution around the cell is hypotonic to cell and water moves out of the cell by osmosis, causing the cell to lose turgor. Turgor means the fluid pressure. So cell membrane here not visible because of course it is hearing, but here what we can see is because it has now shrunk and the water has moved out because it has been placed in salt water. Now let's look at animal cells. Now when you place an animal cell in a hypotonic solution means inside it is 2% and outside it is 1%. So water is going to move in and the cell is going to rupture. Why? Because it has no cell wall. But in a isotonic solution, meaning it's 2% here and a 2% outside, the liquid outside is also 2%. Well, then there is no net movement. If 10 molecules of water entering, 10 are leaving it. So 10 entering, 10 leaving it. So there is, it's normal. The cell remains normal. But if it's in a hypertonic solution, meaning inside it is 2% and outside it is 3%, then water is going to move out and this is going to shrink. But in plant cells, it's not the same situation. It's turgid, flaccid. If it's an isotonic, it's flaccid. If it's a hypotonic, it is turgid. And if it is a hypertonic, it is plasmolized. Hypotonic, as I told you in a previous diagram, what does hypotonic mean?
Now, please uh, pause the video here and have a look at this and read through it so that you know the exact biological English to write. Now, what is the difference about the plant and animal cell during the process of osmosis? Plant cells have cell walls which help them to keep their shape. And the central vacuole in each plant cell stores the water. But in animal cells, you can see it's not the situation. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. Animal cells do not have a, so in isotonic solutions, they remain the same. That's fine. Isotonic means that they'll remain the same. So there's nothing will happen to it. Hypertonic means water is going to move out. Hypotonic means water is going to move in. Hypotonic. Now, again, another diagram explaining the same thing to you. Higher water potential than the inside of the cell, water moves in, animal cells will burst. If it's the same, nothing will happen. So isotonic, same. But if it's a lower water potential than inside, then water moves out of the cell, the animal cells will shrink. And a red blood cell, we say, is called cremation. Cremation. Please don't say cremation. Cremation is when you burn the dead body. This is cremation. There's an N in it, not an M in it. So this is cremation. Don't get this wrong, please. And the same thing in plant cells, of course, then plant cells become turgid, plant cells in an isotonic flaccid and then plasmolyzed and cell shrinks and the protoplast pulls away from the cell wall. Another diagram showing you the uh, what happens when they place it in distal water, cells swell and burst. And when you put it in a concentrated salt solution, then the cells shrink and shrivel. So this is how you see, this is what you will see, what it looks like cell will swell up and burst and of course in this case it is shrunk and that is called crenation. Now coming to the next heading active transport. Now active transport first of all you've got to see this is the phospholipid bilayer so this is how we represent it. Of course you study more of it in A levels rather than O levels. But the important thing you've got to see is that there is low concentration of you see there are only one two three four molecules here. And here they are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven molecules here. So it is from a low concentration to a high concentration of molecules. Then the next thing which you've got to realize is there has to be a channel protein. This is the channel protein which spans the membrane. This is the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. And this is the channel protein. But the channel protein, an important thing, has an ATP binding site. So the ATP binds to it and becomes ADP and energy is released. You must remember ATP is the universal energy currency. So universal energy currency, all living organisms, whether they are plants or animals or bacteria or fungus, they use ATP. Just like you've got to charge your phone, so you're going to plug it into the electrical connection, not in the gas connection. So energy is released and that energy is needed to make it change its shape, pick up the molecule from a low concentration. It's either molecules or ions. So pick them up from a low concentration and throw them to the other side, which already has a high concentration. So it is against the concentration gradient and that, that is why it requires energy and this energy is released by respiration and you know respiration can be of two types can be aerobic or anaerobic. Another diagram showing you this how the movement of materials of course molecules and ions against the concentration and you can see the cell membrane and you can see the channel protein and how it is going to change its shape and is going to throw that from a low to a high concentration. Now, as you can see here, active transport is a big advantage to cells because it allows an organism to move material against a diffusion gradient. In this way, an organism can absorb all of a vital substance such as trace elements or amino acids. There are three vital points about active transport. It takes place against a concentration gradient. It uses specific proteins in the cell membrane, not in the cell wall, in the cell membrane. It needs energy provided by respiration of the cell. Another diagram from your book, substance combines with carrier protein molecules, carrier transport substances across the membrane using energy from respiration and substance released into the cell. So it's from a low concentration to a high concentration and it is going to be picked up and is going to be 
against the concentration gradient. Of course, we need this where epithelial cells in the villi of a small intestine have the role of absorbing glucose against the concentration gradient. And the cells will contain numerous mitochondria in which respiration takes place. The chemical energy produced is converted into kinetic energy for the movement of the glucose molecules. The same type of process occurs in the cells of the kidney tubules for the reabsorption of glucose into the bloodstream against their concentration gradient. Now in plants, the important thing you've got to remember, it needs to absorb mineral salts from the soil, but these salts are in very dilute solutions. So active transport enables the cells of plant roots to take up salts from the dilute solution against the concentration gradient. Again, chemical energy from respiration is converted into kinetic energy for the movement of the salts. Now, I want you to see these diagrams and uh, visualize where the root hair cells are. And where are the root hairs? There's a root cap, there's a root tip, and then you can see the xylem and the phloem, and you can see these root hairs, and then you can see the root hair here. This is what they would look on a slide, on a microscopic slide, which you might get a diagram of in the later chapters, which we'll study. Now you can see um, a diagram, which I know it's not a very nice one, it's rather a pathetic diagram. But then you can see how I've labeled, I've used the same color, so this is the cell wall in black. Then you can see there are a whole lot of these mitochondria in gray. And then the cell membrane is in red. And this is a root hair cell to which another cell has been added, and this is the cell of the cortex. And water is going to move in, number one, of course, water moves in by osmosis. So that's not something very uh, difficult because it's from a higher water potential to a lower water potential. But then what we need to study is why do we need these carrier proteins and where are these carrier proteins? They are in the cell membrane. The red is the cell membrane and you have these carrier proteins, which of course require ATP, which is the energy currency. And what are they going to take in? Because what we need is we need to get the magnesium ions into it. And this is by active transport because they may be in a lesser concentration here and in a higher concentration inside the cell, but still they would move in by active transport. Similarly, we need nitrate ions. So, well, how are we going to get the nitrate ions into the, because they're already say they're 20 here, but they're 40 inside here. So they have to move in by active transport. So the nitrate ions and the magnesium ions are going to move in by active transport and across this channel protein, which is embedded in the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, these channel proteins are embedded and they of course require ATP or they require ATP or they, you can say they require energy. And this is of course being released by the process of respiration. Like we say in cars, fuel is burnt by combustion to release energy. But here in living cells, the process of combustion doesn't take place, it is respiration. But you must equate combustion and respiration. It's the same process, but of that of course occur in engines, but here it occurs in living cells. When we study respiration, we'll talk about that. So respiration is going to take place and you know, this is going to occur in the mitochondria. And if it's aerobic, that means oxygen is needed. So oxygen is going to also move in through the air spaces in the soil. And the oxygen is going to move in and aerobic respiration is going to take place in the mitochondria and energy is going to be released and these ions are going to be taken up by active transport. Uh, this completes the theoretical part of uh, chapter three and the practical work will continue in the third video which is followed by this in which we will discuss only the practical concerned with diffusion and osmosis. Thank you for watching.